Good morning. I want to welcome you to Open Door Church. Thank you so much for uh, coming to worship the Lord with us. And that is exactly what we intend to do today is celebrate Him through song, celebrate Him through His Word. We also today, uh, you'll have the privilege of hearing a special guest, Brother Bill Webster is here with us from Voice of the Martyrs, and so he is going to be bringing a testimony telling us about some things that are going on in our world that uh, you probably have not heard and that we need to know about. His wife, Anne Marie, is with him, so we appreciate so much uh, the two of you coming to be with us today, and a little bit you'll be able to, uh, to hear from him as he shares these testimonies with us. And so at this point... Let's go to the Lord in prayer and just ask His blessings upon this day, upon this service, and upon each of us, because certainly we have come in need of a touch from Him. And so we just want to celebrate Him. We also have a first time, we have several first time uh, guests today. We have, have some with us. We also have a little special one right back in the back hiding. Uh, she can't wave to you yet, but, uh, but you'll want to uh, see this new edition uh, and celebrate uh, with the parents. God bless you. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, as we come to you, thank you, dear God, for this day. Thank you that it is indeed the day that you have made. And as we see the uh, bright sunshine, we know that every day that you are uh, blessing us, we know that every day that we can draw near to you. Father, as we come to you today, we need a touch from you. We need your spirit to be working in our lives. And I just pray that Lord, every person here might open their hearts, might open their minds, that they may be able to hear from you the message that you have for them. Lord, we ask that you bless Brother Bill as he shares with us and bless us as we sing, and then bless the message from your word. And we'll give you praise for all that you do today, for we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. something. I brought my bag with me, and I've got something in my bag, and I want you to guess what it is. Okay? It is, you know that it's small enough to fit in the bag, right? Okay? It's something that is very important because with it, I can bless people. With, with it, I can hurt people. Okay? There's something in my bag that I never leave home without it. And I brought it here with me today. Who wants to guess what's in my bag? A train. A, tr a what? A train. A train. No, it's not. I sometimes leave home without my train. Who else? A Bible, a Bible. I can bless people with a Bible, right? But can I hurt people with a Bible? Can I hurt them with it? I guess if I hit them with it, but that's not, that wouldn't be a good thing. God wouldn't like that. What do I have in my bag? A snake. A snake? <laughs> no, we're not that type of church. Uh, so, who else? What do I have in my bag? Something I never leave home without. Something that, uh, something I can bless people with or hurt people with, and it's my choice. Any other guesses? You want to see? Look. Who wants to look? Look. What's in my bag? Paper. No, oh, that's that's not what's supposed to be in my bag. Let me put that away. I didn't know that was in my bag. What's in my bag now? Nothing. 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 What's in my bag now? You sure there's nothing in it? Your hand. Your what hand. is it? It's my hand. That's what's in my bag. I never leave home without it. Right? Watch. It's my watch. <laughs> my sleeve. Well, let's talk about my hand, okay? Because, you know, with my hand... I can bless people, can't I? How can I bless people with my hand? Well, let's talk about hurting people first. How can I hurt people with my hand? Anybody know? Hit them. You could hit them with the hand. Is that a good thing? 
That's not a good thing. You can squeeze them. You can squeeze them with my hand? What else can I do? You can punch them. You can punch them? Yeah. Kick them. You kick them. With my hand, I can kick them? With my feet. With my feet, yeah. But I didn't have my foot in my bag. I just had my hand. Yeah, see, you can use your hand for bad things, right? I could use my hand to steal something from you. I know. Right? Would that be a good thing? If I took something that belonged to you and said, I'll just have that for mine? No. Is that good? No. No. See, I could hurt people with my hand. But how can I bless them with my hand? How can I bless them? By being nice. By being nice. And how can I be nice with my hand? Not heavy, Mom. Not heavy. <laughs> Keep it to myself. That's right. That's right. How else can I help them with my hand? If they drop something, you can pick it up with them. That's right. How else? What do you think? When they smash it, you're going to pick it up. Yeah, that's right. And you kick them. <laughs> okay. But you know, sometimes, sometimes all I have to do if someone is sad is I can pat them on the back and tell them it's going to be okay, can't I? I can reach out and take care of them. If they need something, I can give it to them. So I can bless them with my hand. Do you know what? Jesus reached out and touched people. And He helped them when they were, when nobody else wanted to touch them. Jesus touched them. Jesus wanted them to know that He cared about them, that He loved them. And there was a man who came to Him who was very sick and nobody would touch that man. But you know what Jesus did? Sick. Yeah, if, they, if you're sick, you and can take care of them. And you, you give them medicine? Yeah, you can. So see, you can use your hand for good or for bad. Jesus used his hand to bless people. And we need to do the same. Okay? So your teacher's going to teach you a lesson today, and you're going to have a good time in children's church. So let's bow together for prayer, and then we'll go to children's church. Everybody bow together with me. Bow your heads, close your eyes. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessing today. Thank you for being with the children and bringing them here to church. And I just pray that each one of them would learn exactly what you want them to learn. I pray that you'll bless the teachers. Just give them the words to say. And Lord, we ask that today would be a day that we would use our hands to be a blessing and never use them to hurt anyone. That we might be like Jesus. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can line up and go to Children's Church. You know, it's great to see the children here. Um, in North Korea, people don't tell their children about Jesus until they're at least 15 years old because while they're in school, which they have to be up until 15, Teachers will do something which they'll tell them they want to have this uh, fun time with them. So if anybody at home has one of these secret books, if they just bring it in tomorrow, they get a prize. The prize that they get is that their parents end up in, in prison for 10, 15, 20 years for having this Bible. Okay? Or they might even be executed. So my name is Bill Webster. I'm a volunteer with the Voice of the Martyrs. And uh, I'm here this morning to tell you about persecution of Christians around the world. And um, I'm going to set my timer here so I don't go over time. <laughs> um, and about the Voice of the Mars, which is an organization that was uh, put together by a pastor uh, from Romania. His name was Richard Wormbrand. And uh, when the communists took over Romania from the, from the Nazis, um, all of the religious leaders were brought together and they were told to get up in front of everybody and, and to denounce Christ and to proclaim that communism was a good thing. Richard refused to do that. Uh, shortly after that, he was put in prison. He was in prison for five and a half years. He was released with strict orders not to preach about Christ again. Uh, he immediately started to do that, was rearrested, put back in prison. He spent a total of 14 years in prison. Three years were in a solitary confinement cell that was 30 feet below the ground. He saw no daylight for, for three full years. The only people he saw were those who came to torture him. Uh, when, while he was in prison the second time, his wife was put into a labor camp because she was there for three years. 
her 11-year-old son was left on his own, and other Christians helped him out and took care of him. When Richard and Sabrina uh, got out of prison, they were ransomed out of Romania. They came to the United States, again under the threat of death if they were to tell anything about what had happened to them and what was going on in the communist uh, world. Um, he defied that. He went around the country speaking. He went before Congress and spoke. He um, um, testified about what had happened to him. He, for Congress, he stripped down to his waist and showed 18 scars on his body from the, from the uh, tortures that he had gone through. Um, in 1967, they started um, a mission, which was called Jesus to the Communist World. And they started it um, by, Richard wrote this book, Tortured for Christ, which is his story about uh, how he was arrested, what led up to it, the situation that he went through while he was in prison, their release, and their coming to the United States and starting the ministry. Um, they um, started the ministry basically with a newsletter that they typed on a typewriter. Anybody remembers those things? No. <laughs> uh, but they typed it on a typewriter and they, they had a mailing list of about 200 people. They started mailing this out to keep them informed. And um, the newsletter that you were handed when you came in today is a, is a special edition newsletter that's only available through speaking engagements like this. But inside of it is the story about Richard in, in the centerfold. There's also a map in there. The map tells you about countries where persecution takes place. And um, it's color-coded. Orange countries are countries where um, it's illegal to be a Christian. It's illegal to have a Bible. It's illegal to join together to worship. Uh, and that's where a lot of persecution takes place, where people are imprisoned, put to death, for this, uh, this terrible crime of having a Bible. Um, the uh, red countries are, are hostile nations where it's legal. The government actually tries to protect people. However, the um, local government officials, local religious leaders, uh, and even family will persecute people for being Christians. Um, <clears throat> The newsletter is available. Uh, we have a newsletter that comes out once a month. It's available. It comes to your home. It's free. And I have some clipboards that we'll pass around. You could sign up for it if you'd like, like to get it. Uh, it comes once a month. It has stories in there about uh, persecution in the world. It has uh, information about ways that you can pray for people who are being persecuted. And it also uh, gives you suggestions about how you can um, become involved with uh, supporting the persecuted church. Our ministry is based on uh, Hebrews 13.3. Remember those in prison as if you were in prison also, uh, as their fellow prisoners, and to those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were being mistreated. In 1992, the name of the organization was changed from uh, Jesus to the Communist World. Uh, which was the original uh, name of the organization to, to, uh, to the Voice of the Martyrs because now the Islamic uh, effect on Christians was taking over in the world and you, you see that around. Um, you know, I don't have time this morning to, to go into a lot of detail around stuff. On the back of that newsletter that, I, that you received is the, the five main purposes and the mission statement of the Voice of the Martyrs, so you can just read that. Uh, so there, there are other things I want to kind of cover today, but um, I, I do want to make sure that you know that North Korea is one of those countries where, it, as I said, it's just illegal, it's, it's horrible. And when we talk to people around the world who are being persecuted, they ask for a couple of things. The first thing that they ask for is for prayer. And so I'd like you guys all to leave here today with a commitment to pray for those who are persecuted. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort. Just add it to your daily prayer list. Just pray for those who are persecuted. If you want to know specifically who to pray for, you go to our website, persecution.com, and um, you, you can find a, a section there called Prisoner Alert, uh, that, where you can find out about prisoners uh, who are who are in prison right now for their beliefs um, and other other aspects um, 
other ways that you can find out what to pray for on our website. Uh, you, you guys are all uh, reading about Nigeria in the newspaper these days. You know the girls that were kidnapped? We, we know that there was about 300 girls who were kidnapped, and that's what we know from reading the paper. Did you know that those are Christian girls that were kidnapped? Did you know that they're being forced to become Muslim brides, convert to Muslim, okay, and to live that life? Um, <clears throat> Yesterday we had a regional conference in Westfield um, and we had speakers that came from all over the world and I'd love to just share about those with you but I don't have time to do that. But I, I could share about Russell who uh, was kidnapped in, in Colombia and held five different times he was kidnapped. Uh, the first time his book tells about he was, he was tied to a tree for six months. It was different trees at different times but he was tied to a tree all the time. Um, <coughs> I could tell you about Sarah, who was in, chi in China, and she was in prison for six years because she was involved with Christian activities. Um, and while she was in prison, she made um, Christmas lights be exported to the United States. I, I could tell you about Todd Nettleton, who works for the Voice of the Myers, who goes around the world meeting with persecuted Christians, and the things that he has seen, and he came back and told us about those things, the people he's met, the situations he's seen. Um, or I could tell you about uh, Semshi, uh, who's from Turkey. And in 2007, her husband and two other Christian men uh, were working in a Christian uh, publishing area. Five men came in, um, kidnapped them, tortured them, and ended up murdering them. Two days later, uh, Semshi and the wife of one of the other men went on television and forgave those people because that's what we're called to do. Christ told us to forgive those who, who, who uh, persecute us. Um, but the story I want to relate to you about that was a little conversation I was having with Todd Nettleton afterward. Um, and he was telling about when, when this murder took place, that two weeks later he went over to Turkey and he interviewed the, um, the wife of, and the, the fiance of two of the men that were persecuted uh, or murdered. And then he, he also um, interviewed Semshi, and they became friends. And she now lives in the United States with her two little kids, a little boy and a little girl, that were there yesterday. And um, Todd has relatives that live close by where she lives in Colorado. So when he goes to visit his relatives, he goes to visit her and her children. And Todd has built a relationship with her, with their family. He was telling us that last Christmas that Semshi and her children went to his family's house and they celebrated Christmas together. And I'm telling you that because you know, here we have a free American who doesn't have to worry about this stuff really, who invests himself in someone who's been through it and shares with her as a family. And that's you and I. We're all part of this family. You know, we are, we are called as brothers and sisters in Christ to share the burdens. And that's what I want you to do today, is to share the burdens that people have. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that we are all, about, all part of a single body, and that the body is made up of many parts. And that if one part suffers, we all suffer. And if one part rejoices, we all rejoice with it. So, uh, some, some ways that you guys can become involved, speed this up a little bit, is, uh, as I said, through prayer. Just be prayer in prayer for these persecuted Christians. And when they ask for prayer, they're asking for prayer for themselves to endure what they're going through. They're asking for prayer for their families who are totally disrupted when a pastor's arrested, when he's murdered. You know, they're left with nothing and uh, they just need to, to strong their own through life. But they also ask for prayer for those who are persecuting them. And while they're in prison, they are witnessing to those who are persecuting them. And they are converting people to Christianity while they're in prison, while they're being tortured by them. Okay? And a lot of these people, when they convert to Christianity, end up in the cell with them. 
it's pretty amazing what's going on there because as the persecution comes in and suppresses, theoretically suppresses, the church is expanding because people, people feel the need to share what they have. <clears throat> We have several programs that you can, you can get involved in, and I'm just going to kind of quickly run through some of them. The um, program we have is I Commit to Pray, where you can go on our website, I Commit to Pray, you can sign up for it, you'll get a weekly uh, email that gives you like three different situations that are current in the world that you can, um, you can uh, get the information and you can put them on your prayer list and be praying for those situations as they're happening. Um, <coughs> We do other things. Um, we, we have a program where you can support a pastor for $35 a month to sign up to support a pastor for one year. Okay? Um, we do things for, for widows and wives of people who are in prison that don't have a way of making a living. We do skills training. We teach them how to become a chicken farmer and provide the chickens so they can raise those chickens, have the eggs to sell and make a living. We teach them how to uh, sew and we give them the equipment so they can start a little business like being seamstress. Uh, we do the, those kind of things. We do emergency housing uh, and other, other means. Uh, children from Christian families in Nigeria are often displaced. They're, they're just lost. And we have a place called the Stevens Center that the Voice of the Martyrs, um, it's a boarding school, the Voice of the Martyrs uh, supplements that and supports it, and we assist them uh, in those things. There's a program called Action Packs where you can put, fill up a bag with needed necessities, um, blankets, sweaters, socks, uh, those type of things, and um, you can send it and we get it into the hands of the people who need it. Blanket and a Bible for the Sudan. Uh, we can send in a, a new or used blanket uh, to the Voice of the Martyrs and we get that into the hands of people. Most, most of those are headed to the Sudanese uh, refugees. That's what we focus on. Uh, North Korea. Uh, we have a program where, as I said, script scripture and Bibles are illegal in North Korea. So what we do is we have a program where we work with uh, Seoul USA, another organization, where we launch balloons into, into North Korea. The balloons are filled with these little scriptures, and um, the balloons are timed so that they open up at different times and different places. And when they do, these things flutter out and fall down wherever they go. People can see them, pick them up, and they've got scripture in their hand. And uh, so that's, that's a neat little program that we have. Um, I mentioned Russell Stendhal in, in Columbia. He has a program where we, uh, the Voice of the Martyrs supplies parachutes to him and, and Christian literature. He flies over the far gorilla locations and the, the drug lord places, and he drops these uh, parachutes with a Galcom radio on it. And it, the, the radio is turned, tuned to Christian radio. So he's getting the message into those people. And these are the people who, who uh, kidnapped him and, and threatened his life and have murdered many of his friends. We have a program called Martyr, uh, Families of Martyrs Fund, which you can contribute to, to provide needs for those people who are displaced because of their, their beliefs. Voice of the Martyrs Medical is another program we have where we go in and we supply prosthetic limbs to people uh, who have lost their limbs in explosions or, or just plain amputation. Some of the Nigerian uh, terrorists, they'll just amputate a guy's leg because it's a good message to your neighbor. You know, don't, don't become a Christian because you'll end up like him. Um, but we also do all kinds of medical treatment wherever we can. If, if uh, a situation takes place and there's medical needs and we can get there, we, we provide them for them. Um, the prosthetics, as I said, reconstructive surgery, uh, just transporting people from where they're at to a place where, where uh, uh, medical attention is available. And the last thing I want to talk about is letter writing. <clears throat> uh, letter writing is a very important uh, piece of the ministry. And you can write letters to people in prison in a couple of different ways. One is uh, the Voice of the Martyrs has a letter writing kit that you can purchase. I think these cost a dollar a piece. You can order them online. And inside of it are the stories of individuals who are in prison being persecuted. Okay, and a, a letter, a self-mailing uh, letter here that you can write the letter to them and mail that directly to them in prison. You can also go on our website, prisoneralert.com, and you can write a letter. And you can 
um, select verses. You can select up to 12 verses, scripture and just uh, other verses. You tie them together in whatever order you want to make up a letter to encourage these people. When you print it out, it comes out with their name and the address of the, where they're in prison. It comes out in English, but most importantly, it comes out in their language. Okay? Now, <clears throat> I had a short video to show, but I'm not going to show that today because of time. But um, the impact of these letters, these people don't always get the letters. In fact, most of the time, they don't get the letters. But the little video I had was of two ladies, Maryam and Mar Marzea, who were in Iran. And over the course of three years, they, they got 20,000 uh, New Testaments into the hands of people. They were eventually caught, and they were put in prison, in Evan Prison in Iran. And their treatment was not very good. But when they, the letters started arriving, um, they said in the interview that I was going to show you that their treatment started to get better. Okay, that they got better food, they, their uh, punishment was less. Um, and those kind of things started happening. Um, as uh, one of the speakers said yesterday, that one, one of the men he had talked to said that when the letters started arriving, they beat him less. Okay, they didn't stop beating him, but they beat him less. So it's important, it's, an, it's a neat thing to do. And I would advise you to, to try to get on our website and do that. Um, I do have some of these letters pre-printed on the table in the, in the fellowship area that you can just take and just mail them. Okay, it costs $1.15 to mail overseas. And so I have some of them you can take them just to get started with. And um, <clears throat> the last thing I want to mention is the Kids of Courage website that we have. Um, I have a lot of little kids here. Uh, and the, the Voice of the Martyrs wants children to understand what's going on, but we want to do it in a way that is child-friendly, something that you can look at and say, yeah, okay, that's okay, my kids can, can see that. So it has the stories of persecution, it has the stories of um, how people are reacting to the persecution, but it's child-friendly. So kidsofcourage.com. Uh, and I will be available in the fellowship area after the service to more fully answer questions. I know I've jumped right across a whole bunch of stuff, but I have some resources out there, some books and uh, things that you're welcome to take. Um, and whatever questions you have, I'll try to answer. Okay. Thank you. Compassion. What is it? It is a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who is stricken by misfortune, accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering. As you hear stories, as you hear about people in our world who simply because they are believers in Christ, simply because they dare to have a Bible study in their home, simply because they dare to even have a copy of the Word of God, they suffer. That people even in this day can be imprisoned for such. That girls can be kidnapped and forced into a life that none of them would choose in the day that we live. Surely as we hear the reports, there is a measure of compassion that arises within us where that we want in some way to alleviate the suffering. We want in some way to help in that matter. As I said, I'm going to be talking to you about being passionately compassionate. Well, that word passion is another word that we need to define. It, me define. it means any powerful or compelling emotion or feeling. And I believe it is all right to be passionate about some things. I believe it is all right to have emotion about certain things. And I believe that whenever we know about the needs of others, that we need to be exactly that. We need to be passionately compassionate. In fact, when I look at Jesus, I see the very same thing. And if we are to be the followers of Jesus, if we are to have our lives to be like His, that is exactly the way that we should be. 
Our text is found in Mark chapter 1. We're going to be beginning with verse 40. And I want you to see the story of this one who came to Jesus with a great need in his life. And as he comes to Jesus, even in his coming, his coming to Jesus is a prayer for compassion. You know that sometimes people cry out for somebody to care for their needs. It may be that they may not have to say a thing in order for you to know that what they are doing is crying out for you to care for them. Verse 40, Mark chapter 1 says, And a leper came to Jesus. Now, if you know anything about that day and you know anything about leprosy, you understand that to be a leper in that day was to be isolated from everyone. It was to be treated as though you were uh, less than anything that you could imagine because when you could not approach people, when you could not come to them. Now, it may be that this man did not have that disease that we know today as Hansen's disease. But leprosy was a general term in that day that talked about various chronic skin diseases. Many of those diseases were, in fact, contagious. And many of them were painful to the point of being crippling. So you can understand that people were very careful to keep their distance from those who were suffering from such a disease as that. I mean, we in our society, our stay clean society, our desire not to have any germs, we can uh, be close to someone and if we sense that there is anything that is wrong, that they may be contagious, we immediately take a step back. We don't want that in our lives. And so you can imagine as these who even when they would approach you had to cry out and warn you that they were unclean. Can you imagine being such a person. To protect others, they were required to live outside of town and to have no contact. They were required to announce themselves so that others might move away. But the leper of whom Mark speaks in our text was desperate. He was desperate. He came very near to Jesus. He approached Jesus. And why did he do so? He did so because he believed that Jesus was his only hope. And he believed, based on what he had heard about Jesus, that Jesus would not turn him away. Verse 40 goes on to say, beseeching him and falling down on his knees before him. This is what the leper did. He fell on his knees with his face to the ground. Some would have felt that he was terribly bold to approach Jesus in this way. Well, Mark records his actions as being, as best as he can describe them, full of deep humility. Now, how important that is. The leper knew that he had no right to expect Jesus to help him. The leper knew that he was at the mercy of Jesus. And let me say to you that that is a wonderful place to be. For us to understand that our only hope is Jesus. For us to understand that we have no right to expect anything from the Lord Jesus is a good place to be. For if we approach Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and we think that somehow He owes something to us, then we cannot come close to Jesus. But we need to come as the leper came, knowing that He is our only hope and knowing that He cares about us. So let us learn from Him to begin with. Learn this prayer for compassion. Now whatever your knee, need might be, you need to bow your knee in humility to Christ. It says in verse 40 that He said to Jesus, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now notice those two words, you can. 
Now think about that. Certainly nobody had dared to approach this man and to tell him about Jesus. Nobody had dared to step up to him and say, let me share with you, my friend, about the Lord Jesus and what he is doing. But God had allowed him to hear, probably at a distance, the testimony of others regarding Jesus. So how did he come to such faith as this? Well, it had to be that he came to faith in Jesus just the way that we have to come to faith in Jesus, that God's Holy Spirit takes that word that may have been spoken, he quickens it to our heart. The coals of faith begin to stir up into flames, and we respond. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. What a blessing it is that Scripture is being airdropped, if you would, into places where they would not have access to the Word of God. What a blessing that is. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. This man believed in the almighty power of Jesus. I hope that you do as well. That whatever your need is, whatever problem is going on in your life, that you know that Jesus has the power to do something about that. He also believed in the compassion of Jesus. He said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. You, Jesus, can heal me of this terrible disease. He knew that the law had declared him to be unclean. But he says to Jesus, you can make me clean. You can legally make me clean. You can cleanse me so that you can restore me to all that the disease has taken from me. Now friends, we need to understand something. We need to understand that every one of us are lepers spiritually. Every one of us. That every one of us are unclean within ourselves. That every one of us are tainted by sin so that we are with a death sentence upon us. And so every one of us need to be able to come to Jesus and pray that prayer for compassion. You see, this is the prayer to pray when you are awakened to the reality of the truth that your soul is unclean and that that condition renders you distanced from holy God. It is the prayer that must be prayed if anything is to be done about your spiritual condition. You need to come to that place of saying, Lord, you can make me clean. And come trusting that Jesus can do that. The prayer for compassion. Have you prayed that prayer? The second thing is the power of compassion. Verse 41 says that Jesus was moved with compassion. Jesus was deeply moved by that man's condition and by his plea for help. Now, if Webster's Dictionary wanted to put a picture next to the word compassion, there would be no better picture that you could put than a picture of Jesus reaching out to a leper to heal him. Compassion. Verse 41 says, Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand. And what did he do? He did what no one else would do. He touched him. How important was that for that man to be touched by Jesus? Everyone else, when they knew who he was and knew what his problem was, they stepped back from him. But here Jesus, moved with compassion, reaches out his hand and he touched him. And he said to him, I am willing. Be cleansed. I am willing. You see, the poor leper put an if upon what Christ might do in response to his request. He said, if you are willing. But Jesus soon put that doubt to rest. He stretched out his hand and he touched the untouchable. Now to touch a leprous man was to bring defilement upon yourself so that you were considered by the law to be unclean as well as that person. But Jesus, being who he is, could not be defiled. Instead, he affirmed his willingness through his action and he healed the disease for which there was no cure. 
And when he touched that leper, it was not that Jesus became unclean, but it was that the leper became clean because immediately he was healed. And that's what the Scripture says. Verse 42, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Now think about that. There are people that think if they'll turn their attention to Jesus, there are people who think that if they will somehow put their faith in Jesus, that they begin on a road that might end up with them being acceptable to God so that they can enter into the glory of heaven. But that is not the teaching of the Word of God. The teaching of the Word of God is when you come to Jesus and you pray that prayer for compassion and He gives you that gift of eternal life that He has promised to all of those who would confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God raised Him from the dead, they are immediately cleansed. Immediately. This cure was complete and it was instantaneous. The leprosy vanishes and there remains no sign of it. Here is absolute proof of our Lord's divine power because only God can work such a miracle. Jesus does it not by calling on His Father through prayer, but He does it of His own will because He is God, the Son. He needed to call on no power other than His own, the divine Son of God, our Lord and Savior. Let me ask you the question, have you experienced His transforming touch? You came to Him saying, Lord, I need compassion. Lord, I am a sinner. I am separated from you. I am unclean spiritually. But Lord, I know that you died on that cross to pay for my sins and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And as soon as you do, the Holy Spirit of God comes into your life and you are transformed. That transforming touch, the touch of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go further in our story, for I want you to see the proclamation of compassion. I am not sure that it is even possible for most of us to imagine the emotions that flooded this man's heart as he first felt the touch of the Master's hand and then realized the change that had taken place in his body. Surely he wanted to rush home and tell his family. Surely he wanted to go through the streets proclaiming the good news of Jesus. The fact that Jesus had touched him and made him whole. Certainly he wanted to tell everyone he knew. Everyone who themselves were suffering from this disease. He wanted to let everybody know. But notice that Jesus tells this man in no uncertain terms that he is not to make any public proclamation of the healing. It says in verses 43 and verse 44, And he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. What is this? It says he sternly warned him. Now that is a strong word. In fact, it is a word that was used of a wild horse when someone would try to capture it. And that horse uh, snorts in defiance and lets that person know, you come near to me and you're in jeopardy. Well, Jesus, with just that strong of a statement, he tells this man, see that you say nothing to anyone. The word means to reprimand somebody. It means to urgently rebuke somebody. And then it says, and he immediately sent him away. The word here is equally strong. It means literally that Jesus drove this man away. Now why would Jesus treat the man in a way that we would think is a harsh treatment after dealing with him so compassionately? Well, Jesus knew that such a testimony as this would awaken the opposition of his enemies prematurely and would actually hinder his ministry rather than enhance it. Now we understand that as we read further in the text and we discover what happens when this man does not follow the Lord's instruction. But first notice what Jesus did tell him to do. He says in verse 44, But go, show yourself to the priest. 
Now the command to report to the priest was in accord with Mosaic regulations. It was for the man's sake. You see, without the formal testimony of the priest, the people would not receive the leper as officially clean. It was only with the priest's pronouncement of the man's healing that he would again be allowed to worship God in the temple. And so Jesus said, go and show yourself to the priest. He says, and to offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. You need to go and make a sacrifice. You need to go and make an offering. Those things prescribed in the 14th chapter of Leviticus was an offering of two birds and hyssop. And after eight days, two he lambs without blemish, one ewe lamb along with fine flour and oil. The scripture was very specific. Jesus said, this do. You go to the priest, you tell him about your healing, and you offer the sacrifice that is prescribed for you to offer. He did this in order that the man might be declared to be clean and he might be able to worship God in the temple. He says, do this as a testimony to them. Now the testimony of the man might be rejected, but if the heal proof of the healing were first offered to the priest, that testimony would be decisive and it would not be easily set aside. So the man is told, don't go out and tell everybody else. Just go to the priest and do this, and that's all that you need to do. But the man did not do what he had been told. Look at verse 45. It says, but he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer, listen to it, could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. The man did not do what Jesus told him to do. The man's been healed. He's been told to be quiet. But he goes out and he proclaims it. But I want you to notice something beautiful even in this. Because despite the man's disobedience, despite the difficulty that his disobedience caused the Lord, I find evidence that this offense was forgiven by Jesus. We see what happened, but we also need to note what did not happen. This man's disobedience did not cause him to once again be afflicted with leprosy. You see, our Lord's com compassion was not extended to him conditionally. And let me tell you that when you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your hope does not rest in your perfect obedience. Your hope, hope does not rest in what you might be able to do and how perfectly you walk the line that God has set before you. Your hope rests in this. It rests in what Jesus has done for you. This man immediately disobeys God. We say, well, we can understand that. Look at what's happened to him. This was something that we can imagine would take place. And yes, it is natural to do it. But Jesus does not withdraw his blessing when he does. How glad I am that when Christ does a work of healing of our greatest disease, that disease of sin, that it is unconditional. If we could forfeit the forgiveness we received at the point of our salvation through our subsequent disobedience, we would all have fallen back under the condemnation of our sins almost immediately. How long after you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior was it before you fell before you did something you knew was not pleasing to God. It would all be pointless if our salvation depended on anything other than Jesus. You might have thought our Lord to be cruel if this man's leprosy had returned as a result of his simply making known his cure. After all, he was so deeply changed by Jesus. Every circumstance of his life was different because the Lord had touched him. But it is still true that he followed his own feelings rather than the command of the Savior, and that was disobedience. The man, however, suffers nothing from it, but our Lord was the one for whom it created Difficulty. He could no longer stay in the city, but he had to go out into those other places. And when we are disobedient to the Lord after we have been saved, it does not cause us to lose our relationship with God. 
there should be a desire in our hearts to do exactly what the Lord Jesus tells us to do. Now there are a lot of believers today who would like it very much if they could confess faith in Christ and then not tell anyone about it. That seems to be the affliction that we have in this day. It's not that we are overzealous and we want to tell everybody what has happened to us and the change that has taken place. It seems like in our day we are told to go out and tell and yet we are silent. But even in that, we know that we have a relationship with Him. We've been considering an instance where Jesus put the needs of another ahead of His own interest and His own needs, and certainly that is not unusual for Jesus. Neither should it be unusual for His followers. He was passionately compassionate about the needs of others, and we need to do the same thing. Probably none of us have ever met anyone who had a physical need comparable to that leper that Jesus healed. But we are surrounded by people with spiritual leprosy people who are unclean before God. We know that there is hope for them because at one time we were like them. And we came to Jesus and He took care of us. Will they have to hear at a distance from someone else? Or will we come close to the one who is spiritually separated from God and put our extend our hand of love and use this hand for good to as best we can minister to them to reach out to them in order that they might reach out to Jesus you see Jesus the son of God came to do the will of God that culminated in Him giving His life as payment for our sins, for the sins of all the world. And there's not a person stirred by the Holy Spirit of God to understand their need that has to say, if you are willing. Because the Bible says, whoever will may come. If you're here this morning and You've never done anything about that spiritual condition. You've never done anything about the fact that the Bible says because of your sin, because of your willingness to do that which you know was not pleasing to God, that you've become separated from God. If you've never come to that place to where that you understand that you need the saving power of Jesus to cleanse you, that Jesus died on that cross to pay for your sins, and you've never bowed a knee to Him, now is the day. This is the day. To de now is the time for you to come to faith in Christ and respond to Him. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord, what does it say? He might be saved. It says He will be saved. So I want to encourage you today, if you've never done that, that you would give your heart the Lord Jesus Christ. And it may be that, that this morning you understand that need. You hear about people that are suffering for their faith in other parts of the world and you say, well, that wouldn't be me because I've never come to faith. Today is the day to get that right with God. You're here and you say, well, Pastor, I know that I'm a believer. I know that I've come to faith in Christ. But if I were in one of those countries, nobody would be able to tell it. And so I know I'd be safe. What a terrible thing. What a terrible thing. To be so well hidden that no one would know about your faith. Let us who know the Lord Jesus Christ come before Him now and repent of being silent when there's so much to share. I'm going to ask that you bow your heads, close your eyes. and uh, During this time, I want to ask you to do what the Lord would have you to do. Somehow, some way, God has spoken to your heart today. He's the only one who knows your true spiritual condition. You know it as well. You and Him. None of the rest of us can know. 
We can see you on the outside and say, oh, that's a good person. That's a, that's, a, that's a person that surely has their act together when it comes to God. But we cannot tell from the outside what's going on in the inside. And if you've never come to faith in Christ, right now accept that promise that if you would call upon the name of the Lord, you'd be saved. Confess that sin to Him. And say to Him, Lord... Just as surely as that leper had a disease that separated him from other people, I have a spiritual condition that has separated me from you. I am a sinner. But I put my hope and my faith right now completely in you and I ask you to give me the gift of eternal life. Will you open your heart to the Lord? Will you let Him do that work in your life? Right now, before you pray for people who are suffering around the world, ask God to give you voice that you might tell people even here about Jesus. And all around you, people would know of your faith in Christ. Sometimes we live such a secret life that if someone were to walk into this building and see you here, they'd say, well, I didn't know you were spiritual. They don't need to guess. Let's tell them who Jesus is and what He's done for us. Commit that to the Lord this morning. And having done so, now you can pray for those that are suffering for their faith in far off countries. People you will never meet this side of heaven. Pray for them. Pray for their families. Heavenly Father, I pray that we might become passionately compassionate for people and for their needs. Lord, we know that can only take place as we allow you to work in our lives. Help us to see people as you see them. Help us to reach out to them as best as we can to your guidance to your enabling we pray you'll do this for your glory we pray in the precious and holy name of Jesus Amen I want to thank you for coming today we want to invite you to stay with us for the bill told you that he'll be over in the uh, community center in the fellowship area to answer questions that you might have. Last week at the conclusion of the Lord's Supper we received, we gave you an opportunity to give to the Voice of the Martyrs and I told you that if, I know that was just sprung upon you and so if you didn't get a chance to do that you would be willing to do that today. You believe that God would have you to invest in that ministry and I'm going to ask one of our guys to take one of these offering plates and put it right back on the table in the back that you might uh, put an offering there, and that's what it'll, what it'll do. We'll take that, receive it. If you write a check, write it to Open Door Church, because anything that goes in that uh, plate that's at the back, we'll then give a check to the Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, we'll put it together and, and present that check that they might use it in their ministry. God bless you. I hope that you will stay around for coffee and cake. And, and if you'd seen what was over there before you came in here, you'd say, let us go. Let us get over there so that we can enjoy that time of fellowship together. But we want to <laughs> thank you for being here with us today and trust that you'll come back very soon and be with us again. God bless you.
you are dismissed.